aliens invaded Earth, but instead of taking over the planet, were enslaved by humans and forced into labor. Get this fucking side now, we're moving out! Come, let's go, let's go, let's go! Move him out! That's it! An employee of an international company called Multinational United, MNU, named Vikas van de Merva is being interviewed and talks about the organization's primary mission of establishing contact between aliens and humanity. In archival videos and excerpts from interviews, various scientists and experts talk about the arrival of aliens on Earth. In 1982, a giant spaceship appears in the sky above Johannesburg, but for three whole months no one comes out of it, and the government decides to cut a hole inside. Inside the ship, people find thousands of malnourished and obviously unhealthy aliens, which look like huge mollusks, but which are quite intelligent. A working group created by the government begins to place the aliens in a special temporary camp directly beneath their ship. The area is fenced off and controlled by the military, but very soon the alien camp turns into a crime-ridden slum. The South African authorities allocate many funds to adapt and protect the aliens, but the situation in District No. 9 continues to deteriorate. The aliens are beginning to bore the residents of Johannesburg, who believe that there are other important problems besides housing the aliens. However, the aliens are forced to stay on Earth, because their ship is inoperable. Scientists find out that the control module broke away from the main ship and fell to Earth, and launching the giant machine is impossible without it. Police are constantly conducting searches of the aliens' homes and finding warehouses with alien weapons. The crime rate in the district is skyrocketing, and people's discontent is increasing. Residents of surrounding neighborhoods contemptuously call the aliens prawns and demand that they be evicted from the city. Twenty years after the arrival of the prawns on Earth, the authorities decide to relocate the aliens to District No. 10 and tighten control over them. To accomplish this, the government turns to MNU, for which this operation becomes the largest in all its years of existence. Its employees must now relocate 1.8 million prawns from District No. 9 and the new District No. 10, which is located 200 kilometers from Johannesburg and is a huge tent city that looks more like a concentration camp. Vikas van de Merva is promoted by his father-in-law named Pete Smith and becomes head of the operation to evict the aliens. The man is very optimistic and believes that the operation will be successful. Technically, the prawns are legal citizens of South Africa, so MNU must comply with the law and serve the aliens with eviction notices within 24 hours. You just put your school in The company is aware of all the risks involved in the operation, so a special military unit commanded by Colonel Kubis Venter is dispatched to District No. 9 along with MNU personnel. The aliens, upon noticing MNU agents and mercenaries, begin to behave aggressively. Some of them attack people and damage their property, so the military has to destroy them on the spot. The kiss is against violence, so he decides to distract the group of hostile prawns with cat food, to which all the aliens have a strange affinity. In addition, the agents also get some signatures in exchange for cans of cat food. From snippets of interviews, it is revealed that the aliens who find themselves on Earth are all working class people who, for some unknown reason, have lost their leaders. Soon after its creation, District No. 9 comes under the control of the Nigerian Mafia, led by Obisanho, a very powerful figure in the criminal world of Johannesburg. The mob establishes its own laws and oppresses the aliens. In one of the houses, Vikis and his assistants discover many alien eggs with embryos. The head of the operation cheerfully shows how to destroy them, after which the house is burned down, because it takes too long to get rid of the eggs one by one. It's almost like a popcorn! The agents continue to raid the aliens' homes and, in addition to collecting signatures, confiscate their weapons, for that is really what the MNU is all about. The officers thought they could use super-powerful alien weapons, but it turns out it's not that simple. It turns out that the aliens' technology is biologically based and can only interact with their DNA, which means that humans can't control it. Vikis and his men break into yet another house. The head of the operation is sure that there are weapons to be found here. Vikis notices a secret entrance in the wall, but behind it he discovers not a weapons depot but a chemical laboratory. He searches the entire room and suddenly finds a metal cylinder among the junk. Vikas realizes that this artifact is clearly not earthly and tries to figure out what's inside the flask. Suddenly a strange black liquid spurts out of the cylinder, splashing all over Vikas's face. The man has no idea what the incident will do to him. The MNU agents confiscate the dangerous artifact and are about to take it to the lab for analysis. This finding makes Vikas very happy, but he senses that he will find a weapons cache in this house as well. His assumptions turn out to be correct, and he already calls in airborne reinforcements to apprehend the lawbreaker. However, the owner of the house is not about to give up and fights back against the agents and the military. As a result of the skirmish with the soldiers, Vikas suffers a serious injury to his left arm. Vikas's colleagues insist on hospitalization, but the man is determined to continue the operation. Vikas gets his arm treated and bandaged, and he heads for the next house. The agents demand a signature from an alien named Christopher Johnson, who lives there with his young son. 
he refuses to sign the notice, and Vicus immediately realizes that Christopher is smarter than the other prawns. Vicus proceeds differently with him, he threatens the alien with the removal of his son, who will be taken away by social services if he does not sign the papers. The agent is already going inside the house to get Christopher's son and suddenly discovers an entire warehouse of computer equipment. Suddenly Vicus gets sick and runs out of the alien house. The entire MNU team is concerned about their boss's health, and they leave District Number 9 alone for a while, leaving Christopher and his son alone. Already in town, in addition to his overall indisposition, Vicus shows strange symptoms. His nose is bleeding black fluid, and the nails on his right hand are peeling off. <laughs> Meanwhile, interviewed experts talk about the Nigerian Mafia, which has already accumulated a large number of alien weapons and is trying by all means to gain the ability to use them. For this purpose, Nigerians conduct special rituals and eat alien body parts, but nothing helps, and the most powerful extraterrestrial weapons remain useless in human hands. Vikas van de Merva returns home. His wife, Tanya, throws a party to celebrate her husband's promotion. But Vikas is not happy with the numerous guests. He gets even worse. He vomits black liquid right on the party table, after which he loses consciousness. He is taken to the hospital. When the bandage is opened, it is discovered that the man's injured arm has turned into a three-toed alien hand. Vikas is horrified by such a sight. The doctor immediately reports the mysterious mutation to MNU, and a few minutes later, special agents arrive in the room and immediately transport the unfortunate man to the company laboratory. After searching through Vikas's belongings, the doctors find the cylinder with the liquid that infected the man. Many tests are run on him at the hospital, and it is discovered that Vikas can now use an extraterrestrial weapon, as his DNA is a mix between human and alien. MNU management decides to dissect Vicus and extract the mutated cells, tissues and organs that will become the basis of a biotechnological breakthrough and bring billions of dollars to the government. Of course, the poor guy would not survive such an operation, but the management does not care about this fact at all. Vicus begs his father-in-law to help him, but he only promises his colleagues to sort things out with the man's relatives. In the last seconds before the dissection begins, Vicus manages to break free and escape from the MNU lab. <laughs> Pete Smith explains to his daughter that Vicus has a very serious health problem and is unlikely to survive, but suddenly he is informed of the man's escape right out of the operating room, and Smith should use his best efforts to find him. Vicus becomes a valuable artifact for MNU, because so far he is the only person on Earth whose DNA has been successfully fused with alien genetics. Now the former agent is being hunted. The unfortunate man is forced to hide from the military wherever he goes, and his health continues to deteriorate. Exhausted and hungry Vicus makes it to a diner, but suddenly one of the TV channels starts broadcasting a message that due to sexual contact with an alien, he was infected with a certain contagious and dangerous disease. Vicus is shocked by MNU's blatant lies and tries to prove to the people in the diner that everything they have heard is false. After such news, however, nobody wants to help him. The man tries to contact his wife, but she does not pick up the phone. Photos of Vikas are posted all over the city, and he is covered by all radio and television channels. The desperate man decides to hide in the only place where they won't look for him, in District Number 9. Vikas is forced to eat cat food because he cannot find anything else in District Number 9. The mutation progresses and the man's teeth begin to fall out. Tanya calls Vikas back and tells him that she wants to do nothing more with him. The distraught man tries to explain to his wife that everything they say about his sexual relations with aliens is a lie, but Tanya fails to believe him. Desperate for his wife's words, Vikas makes the impulsive decision to chop off his new alien hand with an axe. However, he lacks determination and only removes one finger. <laughs> Meanwhile, dozens of military helicopters are spotted over the area. Vikas hides from the raid in the house of Christopher Johnson and his young son, whom yesterday he threatened to evict and separate. Now the former agent begs the alien for help. Vikas notices many working computers in Christopher's house, but he soon loses consciousness. Suddenly Johnson notices Vikas' mutated limb. He realizes that this transformation could only have occurred because of contact with the lost artifact and decides to shelter Vikas from the military. The man regains consciousness, and Christopher demands information from him about the whereabouts of the cylinder with the black liquid. Vikas informs him that he confiscated it during a search, and the artifact is now at MNU. Vikas begins to realize that the strange place he woke up in is the same command module that the government has been trying unsuccessfully to find for over 20 years. It turns out that the prawns all these years wanted to activate the engines of the command module and were collecting the remains of the black extraterrestrial substance, without which the operation of the module is impossible. Christopher promises Vikas that he will be able to stop the mutation when they get to the main ship. <laughs> <laughs> 
Are, are, are you saying that you can, you can turn this, this, this brawn hand into, into a human hand? I mean, you can make me human again. However, this requires the stolen liquid container. Vicus realizes he has nothing to lose and agrees to help Christopher recover the artifact. Two days after contact with the black substance, the mutation affects almost all of Vicus's upper torso. The man is terrified to look at his body, covered in horrible sores. Suddenly, the phone rings. Tanya calls Vicus and tells him that she believes him after all and wants things to go back to the way they were before. Vicus promises that he will do everything he can to return to normal life. However, Tanya has betrayed her husband. The conversation with Vicus is tracked, and now the MNU leadership and Colonel Venter know for sure that Vicus is in District No. 9. Realizing that the extraterrestrial fluid will make him normal again and the prawns can return home, he turns to the Nigerian Mafia for alien weapons. However, the bandits are not very friendly. The Nigerians deliver Vicus to the mob boss. Obisanho looks enviously at Vicus' hand, for he dreams of wielding an extraterrestrial weapon, and such a hand would be very useful to him. He orders his underlings to cut off the man's arm in order to eat it and gain a limb like that. But Vicus manages to reach for the most powerful weapon and destroys several of the bandits. Threatening to take out the others, he gets the necessary weapons for himself and Christopher and leaves the Nigerian quarter. Pete Smith and Kubis Venter send a grab team to District No. 9 and order them to bring Vicus to MNU alive. But suddenly a massive explosion is heard outside the entrance to the company headquarters. Vicus and Christopher infiltrate the lab, where they take out the guards using alien weapons. Vicus quickly finds the cylinder with the black liquid and tells Christopher it's time to run. But the alien is shocked by a terrible sight. He sees many dissected bodies of his kin in the laboratory, which apparently have been experimented on. Vicus swears that he knew nothing of any such thing and urges him to leave, but Christopher does not react to the man's words. The military bursts into the lab and opens fire. Vicus manages to bring Christopher out of his trance by reminding him of his son. They shoot back with the alien weapon and manage to find a way out of the lab. After obtaining the missing artifact, Vicus and Christopher return to District No. 9, while the military, led by Colonel Venter, continues to pursue them. Upon reaching the command module hidden underground, Christopher tells Vicus that he can't help him right now. The alien first wants to undertake a rescue mission for his kin, which will take about three years. The duped man stuns Christopher in a rage and decides to start the engine himself. The military arrives at Christopher's house and captures him, while Vicus, along with Christopher's son, is already getting the command module into the air. Kubis orders fire on the target, and the rocket launcher shoots down the module, which collapses to the ground a few seconds later. Kubis infiltrates the downed aircraft and captures Vicus, but Christopher's son manages to hide from the military in the back of the module. Vicus and Christopher are being taken away from District No. 9, but suddenly a Nigerian gang appears in their path, attacking the MNU armored vehicles and kidnapping Vicus in a fierce firefight. The man is taken to Obisanho, who intends to finally chop off and eat his arm. Meanwhile, Christopher's son, who remains in the command module, activates the spaceship's control system. The giant alien ship starts moving and approaches the location of the module. Activating the ship's systems activates all of the aliens' technological gadgets, including the huge exoskeleton that the Nigerians got in exchange for cat food. The combat exoskeleton is programmed to destroy the enemy, so it takes out all the Nigerians, but leaves Vicus alive, mistaking him for one of its own. Vicus decides to use the alien exoskeleton to escape his encirclement. The man leaves Christopher to the military and runs away. Kubis orders them to shoot the alien, for they have never been able to get information from him about the operation of the ship. After a few moments, Vicus makes up his mind to go back and rescue Christopher after all. He helps the alien get to the command module by covering him and firing back. He engages in combat and destroys many military personnel. Vicus does everything he can to ensure that Christopher and his son are able to leave Earth, so he continues to repel the attacks of Kubis's unit. The command module successfully takes off and docks with the ship. As a result of the firefight, the exoskeleton is severely damaged and goes out of commission. The man continues to transform into an alien. His left eye has already become as yellow and huge as the prawns. Kubis, who survived, chases after the unfortunate Vicus and is about to finally finish him off. But suddenly the resident prawns come to Vicus's aid, ripping Kubis apart and devouring him. Meanwhile, Christopher activates the engines, and the alien ship begins to drift away from Earth. Vicus is glad that he was able to help the aliens and that his efforts were not in vain. The inhabitants of Johannesburg run out onto the streets and watch the moving ship in fascination. Now people can't wait to see what happens next. We again witness excerpts from interviews with various experts who speculate about the events that have taken place. It is unknown if Christopher Johnson will return for his own kind, or if he has simply decided to run away, or whether the worst-case scenario will materialize, and Johnson will declare war on mankind.
Also, no one knows if Vikas van de Merva survived. Perhaps he was secretly captured by some corporation or government, but all relatives have already come to terms with the loss. Information about the illegal genetic research has become public, and now MNU is awaiting legal action. The alien population has grown to 2.5 million and continues to grow. Tanya, Vikas's wife, recounts that she recently discovered a strange gift under her door, a rose made of metal plates. She remembers that Vikas always liked to present handmade gifts, but she refuses to believe that the metal rose was brought by her husband. Vikas, finally transformed into an alien, stands on the ruins of District No. 9 and assembles another flower for his wife. Do you think Christopher will return to help Vikas and all his kin? Share your guesses in the comments, like and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next videos.